Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephania Cox. Here are today's top stories. Excessive heat, no clean drinking water and no power. Over a million Louisiana residents are struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. And in Mississippi, two people have died. President Biden says the war in Afghanistan is now over. That's while 100 or more Americans are still in the country. We bring you more from Biden on why he ended the war and why he chose to stick to the evacuation deadline. Two senior officials from the FDA's division in charge of regulating vaccines are stepping down. It's a crucial moment as the agency reviews COVID-19 vaccines for children and booster shots. The Department of Education starts looking into five Republican-led states. They're investigating bans and limits on mask mandates. And as thousands of fire personnel fight West Coast fires, residents evacuate. And the U.S. Forest Service announces the closure of California's national forests. We start the evening with an update on Hurricane Ida, now downgraded to a tropical depression. Around one million people in Louisiana are still without power. In some of the hardest hit areas, this may continue for weeks to come. And some regions also have to deal with water shortages. Here's the latest. Over a million residents in Louisiana have to brace for excessive heat with no air conditioning. Officials issued a heat advisory for the New Orleans region, and it could feel like over 100 degrees in the coming days. Hey, James, do you want some fresh juice? Anybody for some fresh orange juice? It's cold as ice. Some 25,000 utility workers are on the ground, but it could take weeks before power is restored. And in some of the hardest hit areas like Jefferson Parish, residents also face a water problem. Obviously, we have system failures in Upper Jefferson um, with no water, no electricity, no communication. It's very, very difficult times right here, right now. But right now, the focus is on uh, preserving life and, and finding those folks and, and saving them. About 440,000 people had no water service, and an additional 320,000 people were under boil water advisories. Jefferson Parish estimates it could take at least five days to restore the water system. State officials have this message for residents who've already evacuated. If you evacuated Terrebonne or Lafouche Parish, the government officials are urging you to stay where you are. Don't try to come home today. Give it a couple of days. At least four people have died as a result of the hurricane. Part of a highway in Mississippi collapsed and formed a 20-foot deep hole on the ground. Two people died and 10 were injured when seven vehicles plunged into this hole Monday night. And a 71-year-old man got attacked by an alligator in the floodwaters in a New Orleans suburb. He is now missing. There's no power for hundreds of miles. Things are on fire. It's crazy here, man. You see all the trees. Water everywhere, roads are underwater, people are riding around in boats, pumping Florida to try to help out, see what we can do. More than 5,000 National Guard members are working on disaster response, and other states are expected to send more in the coming days. Residents are forming long lines at gas stations, waiting to get fuel for their cars and generators. Over two hours for sure. How long have you been in line? About two and a half hours. How desperate are you for gas? Very desperate. How long have you been waiting in line for gas? Uh, most two hours. But oil companies are beginning to recover. ExxonMobil resumed operations on one of its Gulf platforms. And Colonial Pipelines restored flows to two pipelines by Monday night. Ida is currently a tropical depression moving through Mississippi and Tennessee. It's due to arrive in the Mid-Atlantic region on Thursday. Turning our attention to Afghanistan, President Biden announcing that the America's longest war is now over. He says he chose to end the war to focus on challenges posed by China and Russia. He claimed those two countries would want nothing more than for the U.S. to spend another decade in Afghanistan. NTD's Kevin Hogan brings us more on Biden's remarks. The world is changing. We're engaged in a serious competition with China. We're dealing with the challenges on multiple fronts with Russia. We're confronted with cyber attacks and nuclear proliferation. We have to shore up America's competitiveness to meet these new challenges in the competition 
for the 21st century. President Biden says he remains committed to getting Americans who want to leave out of Afghanistan. And he defended his administration's handling of the evacuation, saying he disagrees with starting it sooner. Though Biden took criticism for the withdrawal that left Americans and Afghans rushing to escape the Taliban. This while two defense officials reportedly told CNN that the U.S. made a secret arrangement with the Taliban to escort Americans to the gates of the Kabul airport. The 20-year war began with a multi-pronged terrorist attack, including the felling of the World Trade Center towers and the ensuing mission Operation Enduring Freedom. And now it ends with the Taliban in control of the country, with the Taliban celebrating in the streets of Herat. And the Taliban control more territory now than they did before the war. What's more, Biden says the August 31st deadline was designed to save lives and that Americans were contacted 19 times since April with warnings and offers to leave Afghanistan. Biden said the Taliban have committed to helping Americans leave. The Taliban has made public commitments broadcast on television and radio across Afghanistan on safe passage for anyone wanting to leave, including those who worked alongside Americans. We don't take them by their word alone, but by their actions. And we have leverage to make sure those commitments are met. Dangerous. The Pentagon acknowledges that there are still Americans stranded in Afghanistan after the pullout. That was in an interview with MSNBC on Tuesday morning. Yet earlier, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said it was irresponsible to say Americans were stranded there. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. And over on Capitol Hill, even with Congress out of session this week, a large group of Republican lawmakers still made their way to the House floor to observe a moment of silence together, honoring the 13 Americans who lost their lives in the terrorist bombing in Kabul last week. Today, the GOP lawmakers also spoke about the end of the evacuation mission, with many Americans and Afghan allies left in the country. A moment of silence on the House floor as lawmakers honor the U.S. servicemen and women who lost their lives at the Kabul airport during the recent suicide bombing. And House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy led a large group of veteran GOP representatives to share their thoughts on the end of the Afghanistan evacuation mission. It's too late to save face. We look weak. Our allies are questioning our commitment. Our enemies are seeking to test us. It's too late to save face but we can still save lives. They want to take action to save the Americans still left in the country, although it's difficult to move any Republican-backed legislation since Democrats have the majority in the House. The Republicans are still urging House Speaker Pelosi to call lawmakers back from their weeks-long recess to take up this issue. Republicans now pushing to pass a bill that would force the Biden administration to give regular updates on Americans still in Afghanistan. It would also require an evacuation plan to be laid out in detail. Whereas just two weeks ago, the president promised this nation that he would not leave until every single American was out. It is still unclear exactly how many Americans are still stuck in Afghanistan, even as the evacuation mission has ended. The Pentagon spokesperson said Tuesday morning more than 100 Americans are still in Afghanistan, and earlier in the day he said a few hundred. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken last night in his press conference said it's less than 200, but it's closer to 100. Earlier in the day, he said it was 250. The fact of the matter is that this administration still has no idea how many Americans they have left behind, behind enemy lines. The Biden administration says that while the military mission with boots on the ground has ended, the State Department is still working on using other channels to rescue the Americans and Afghan allies left there. I believe that we're going to work, we're going to be able to get those people out. I think we're also going to negotiate very hard and very aggressively to get our other Afghan partners out. The military phase is over, but our desire to bring these people out remains as intense as it was before. The weapons have just shifted, if you will, from the military realm to the diplomatic realm, and the Department of State will now take the lead on that. McKenzie confirmed that the last five jets to leave Afghanistan had no American citizens. He says they were prepared to bring more Americans out on those last flights, but none of them had made it to the airport. And at the Kabul airport, the Taliban are now in control. The Taliban fighters can be seen patrolling the airport, which is now quiet and empty. Videos taken today show planes parked at the airport, but no air traffic. The airport no longer has traffic control services. The terminal is empty and damaged cars, armored vehicles, piles of clothes and garbage could be seen on site. 
At around midnight local time on Tuesday, the last U.S. military plane flew out of Kabul. The U.S. and coalition forces evacuated over 123,000 people from this airport in the past two weeks. But between 100 and 200 Americans who want to leave are still stranded in Afghanistan. The war in Afghanistan took the lives of nearly 2,500 U.S. troops and an estimated 240,000 Afghans and cost around $2 trillion. But the Taliban control more territories now than they did before the war. And the situation in Afghanistan has gone from a troop withdrawal to what the Biden administration has called an evacuation. With 13 U.S. service members killed at the Kabul airport, nearly 90 retired high-ranking military officers have signed a letter calling for the resignation of those in charge. Since the situation drastically deteriorated in Afghanistan, Pentagon officials have suggested to the media and the public that there would be a time and a place to assess where things went wrong as the United States withdrew its presence from the war-torn country. However, for nearly 90 retired generals and admirals in the world's most powerful military, the time for this discussion is now. And that is why all 87 former high-ranking military officers have signed a letter calling for both Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley to resign. The letter was wide-ranging and pointed out how there was no concrete plan to evacuate civilians. The dozens of generals and admirals who signed the letter concluded that giving up Bagram Air Base was a dangerous decision, to which the president's military advisers should have strenuously objected. The letter went on to say that the military's shift toward political correctness has laid a groundwork for divisiveness and weakening of warfighting capabilities. Among the generals who signed the letter were retired Brigadier General Donald Bullduck, Lieutenant General Gerald Boykin, and Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney. They also said that the mistakes that were made present opportunities for adversaries like China, Russia, and Iran to take advantage of the situation. The letter is demanding accountability. Many have said that the best way to boost morale among the troops is for senior leadership to buck up and admit fault when mistakes are made. Steve Lance, NTD News, Washington, D.C. More than 122,000 people have been airlifted out of Afghanistan in the past couple of weeks. NTD's Jason Perry spoke with a military contractor in Qatar to find out what the U.S. is doing to make sure none of the Afghan refugees coming to America could be terrorists. With thousands of Afghans having flown out of Kabul each day for the past two weeks, how do we know that not a single person could pose a threat to American security? Special immigrant visa applicants who are still early in the vetting process will first go to bases in Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, or Germany for additional security screening. These places use biometric equipment that scans irises and fingerprints, so it won't matter if an applicant uses a fake name or has fake documents. Uh, the investigators use uh, all sorts of databases uh, to run their checks through, both open source and um, government, uh, government-owned databases. Uh, and <clears throat> if there's derogatory information there, they're going to find it. I mean, these, these guys are good. There's definitely going to be cases where people are, are not going to be allowed in. Some may think the security screenings are not being done properly due to the pressure to speed up the process in order to get the thousands of refugees to America as quickly as possible. Uh, as a matter of fact, our uh, military client is telling us to take all the time that we need to make sure uh, that we're able to provide the information that, you know, that the, uh, the, the determining authority needs to, in, to make an informed decision on whether or not these folks are going to be granted the SIV and allowed to come to the States. It's, it's not a rushed process whatsoever. Dito, who also served in Afghanistan, said the current situation can be a little disheartening. But he said the other day he saw U.S. Special Forces and Rangers laughing, joking, and playing around with the Afghan kids. These guys are out playing soccer with these kids and it's blazing hot sun. And you know, it's, it's so, even though it's, it's a little disheartening, Seeing what's going on in Afghanistan right now uh, from a, uh, a human and a humane standpoint, seeing what's going on right now at the base where I work, it actually, it's actually really fulfilling and it makes the job worthwhile. He says the security vetting in Qatar is just one part of the process and it does not end once the refugees leave Qatar. 
they will continue to have various forms of security checks and interviews after they arrive in the United States. Jason Perry, NTD News. And over in Europe, EU ministers met today to discuss Afghanistan and how Europe will deal with the expected flow of migrants. Ministers agreed to step up aid to Afghanistan and its neighbors, but could not agree on a common policy on accepting asylum seekers fleeing Taliban rule. NTD's Trevor Piper has more. EU governments are eager to avoid a repeat of the chaotic influx of migrants in 2015 that caught the bloc unprepared and sowed divisions among them. Interior and Justice Ministers met on Tuesday in Brussels and discussed how to prevent uncontrolled migration from Afghanistan following the takeover of the country by the Taliban. If we do it quickly and do it right, then yes, then we will not see a repeat of 2015. But if we make mistakes and talk about the right way forward for too long, then it won't be pretty. The meeting comes as the UN Refugee Agency warned that up to half a million Afghans could flee their homeland by the end of the year. We are in a situation, of course, where we need a comprehensive approach towards Afghanistan. We need to avoid a humanitarian crisis. We need to avoid a migratory crisis. And we need to avoid security threats. Western nations involved in the fight against the Taliban have already evacuated 100,000 people who supported them. The issue dividing EU countries is whether asylum should now be extended by the bloc as a whole to other groups considered likely to suffer under the Taliban. Johansson said the bloc should take in Afghan women, children, judges, journalists and human rights activists. At the meeting, the ministers also stressed the need to ensure that those in need received adequate protection primarily in the region. And for that, the EU pledges to give more money for Afghanistan as well as surrounding countries. And what is the most important thing now? The most important thing now is to send the right message into the region. Stay there and we will support the region to help the people there. But EU officials say delivering aid has become more complicated since the Taliban took control. Trevor Piper, NTD News. Turning our attention toward the CCP virus pandemic. The Department of Education has opened investigations into five states. These states have banned or limited mask mandates, which the agency says may be discriminatory in nature. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. Fulfilling President Biden's order, the Department of Education is investigating state limits on mass mandates. They're going after five states, Iowa, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Utah, all of which have limited or banned mass mandates in public schools. In a statement, the Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said it's simply unacceptable that state leaders are putting politics over the health and education of the students they took an oath to serve. The department says they're looking to see if the policies in question discriminate against children with disabilities by cutting off their access to a safe place of learning. It's not discriminating against any student. You're leaving the choice up to the students and the parents to decide what to do about this. I, I think any lawsuit would be dismissed. Hans von Spakovsky is a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He says he believes the Education Department's Office for Civil Rights is trying to mislead the public. So in your view, have any of these states being investigated done anything illegal by banning mask mandates? No, and in fact, I think the uh, Office of Civil Rights the Department of Education is actually misleading the public. Because if you look at their press release and other information they've put out, uh, they make it sound as if they are investigating these states because they have banned anyone from wearing a mask. That, of course, is, is not true. And uh, I, I think it's an intentional misleading of the public because they actually have no basis to even be investigating these states. Florida and other states were left out of these investigations. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida is taking action against two school districts for imposing mask mandates on children without giving them the choice to opt out. The state's education department has withheld the district's monthly school board salaries and says they'll be given once they comply with state law. Miguel Moreno, NTD News.
And two of the FDA's senior vaccine regulators are leaving the agency within the next few months. This comes nearly a week after the FDA approved the Pfizer vaccine and as boosters and shots for children are under review. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. The director of the FDA's Office of Vaccines Research and Review, or OVRR, Dr. Marion Gruber and her deputy, Dr. Philip Krauss, are leaving the FDA. The agency confirmed the departures Tuesday after BioCentury broke the news. The departures come at a particularly crucial time, as booster shots and vaccines for children are being reviewed by the regulator. Gruber, who was with the FDA for 32 years, was one of the two FDA officials who signed the agency's letter of approval for the Pfizer vaccine last week. According to a memo from Peter Marks, director of the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Gruber plans to retire on October 31st, and Kraus plans to leave the FDA in November. The memo did not give a reason for their departures. According to Endpoint News, a former senior FDA leader told the outlet they're leaving because they're frustrated with the CDC's involvement in decisions that they think should be up to the FDA, and that the final straw was the White House getting ahead of the agency on booster shots. A reporter asked White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zeitz about these reports Tuesday during a briefing and whether he's concerned the resignations will affect trust in the FDA and its ability to review vaccines. The FDA has strong leadership in Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Peter Marks at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and their critical work continues as we work to get safe and effective vaccines to the American people. As for the booster shots, Zayed said they made the announcement early in order to allow time for preparation and to be transparent. Dr. Marks will serve as the OVRR's acting director while the FDA finds a replacement to lead the division. Grace Coulter, NTD News. If you want to live somewhere that you don't own, you have to pay rent, at least under normal circumstances. But due to the eviction moratorium, tenants who were affected by the pandemic couldn't be evicted even if they didn't pay. Now, the moratorium is set to expire. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. Behind us, you can see a number of advocacy groups for tenants. They want Kathy Hochul, the new governor of New York, to extend the eviction ban. Now, the Biden administration also wanted to extend the federal eviction ban recently, but that move was blocked by the Supreme Court. This is a crisis issue. Get into session and expand the moratorium. It is simple as that. Some tenants depend on the eviction ban to keep their housing. But others abuse the system and don't pay even though they might have the money, causing problems for landlords. Landlords can ask for emergency rent relief from the state, but if they take that money, they can't evict their tenants for another year. Two weeks ago, I went to a rally calling for an end to the eviction ban. One of the landlords there explained her problem with the rent relief program. If you have problematic tenants like I do that have violence going on, violence, guns, fighting, so it's kind of like a trap, like, yeah, I'm 20 plus thousand dollars in debt, so I want to take the money, but then if I do that, I can't evict them. I told her story to one of the organizers at the pro-eviction moratorium rally. Well, that's one scenario and that does not impact the entire cases of the state. I would tell her to encourage them to apply for the emergency rent relief application. I asked an attendee who's running for public office, what's the middle ground to serve both tenants and landlords? There is no middle ground. We need an evic eviction moratorium immediately from the state. Some tenants have had bad experiences with landlords in the past, which is why they're calling for the eviction ban. Usually tenants who pay and behave well don't get evicted, right? You would think so, but that's what ends up happening because people who many times are in rent regulated buildings, meaning they have more than six apartments and can't increase their rent with a tenant who's already been living there. So they may not renew a lease because they want to increase it for a new community that's coming in. He added that in some cases landlords harass these tenants until they move out if they can't evict them. Aaron Pastar, NTD News, New York. A Northern California teacher boasts about indoctrinating students with communist values in his classroom. Another teacher in Southern California is under investigation for suggesting her students recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the Pride flag. We hear more from NTD's Eileen Eck. 
Project Veritas released a video exposing a high school teacher admitting he indoctrinates his students with communist ideas. Gabriel Geip, an AP government teacher in Sacramento, could be heard talking about turning his students into revolutionaries. I have 180 days to turn them into revolutionaries. The public school teacher believes in a change of cultural propaganda and tries to convince people that socialism is needed. He gives his students extra credit for creating an opposition at events. When there is like right wing rallies and stuff, then we like will create an opposition to that. Yeah. Beautiful. Where would he go to connect with some of these organizations? Like, they... no, I, I post a calendar oh, every okay, week. Awesome. And then so, so like they, it's and I do it for extra credit. So they get points for doing it. Like it, so that encourages them to do it. <laughs> and I've I've had like students show for like protests, community events, you know, tabling, food distribution, all sorts of sorts of things. They when they go, they take pictures, they write up a reflection, that's their extra credit. Gaip also had students complain about things on his classroom wall. Like I, I have an Antifa flag on my on my wall, um, and a student complained about that, and he said it made him feel uncomfortable. And I had to, I addressed it to everyone because I didn't know who it was, and I was like, well, this is meant to make fascists feel uncomfortable. So if you feel uncomfortable, I, I don't really know what to tell you. <laughs> like maybe you shouldn't be aligning with the the values that it, this is antithetical to. In a student news production called Tiger Talk posted on YouTube, the political spectrum and images of Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong are the background. Gaip said there are three other teachers that share his view. NTD reached out to Gaip, the school principal, and Natomas Unified School District, but did not receive a response by deadline. In Orange County, Southern California, another teacher is under investigation for posting a video on social media suggesting her students salute the pride flag instead of the American flag. In the TikTok video, she said she took down the American flag during the pandemic because it made her feel uncomfortable. She packed it away and does not know where it is. My kid today goes, hey, um, it's kind of weird that we just stand and then, you know, we say it to nothing. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I got to find it. Like, I'm working on it. I got you. <laughs> in the meantime, I tell this kid, we do have a flag in the class that you can pledge your allegiance to and he like looks around and he goes oh that one <laughs> in a public statement the school district said we take matters like this seriously showing respect for our nation's flag is an important value that we instill in our students and an expectation of our employees the teacher is no longer in the classroom we follow due process and our investigation continues eileen ang ntd news california Coming up, as thousands of fire crews battle West Coast wildfires, residents evacuate. And the U.S. Forest Service announces the closure of California's national forests. That and more on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. How prepared is your family if a tornado shows up at your doorstep, or a flood, or a hurricane? You can't just turn away a natural disaster. That's why it's important to go to ready.gov slash plan now. It has the tools and tips you need to make an emergency plan with your family. So if disaster comes knocking, let's go. You'll be ready to help keep your family safe. It's just a pizza. Yes. Make a plan today. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. 
Good evening. Thanks for joining us. California's national forests are under temporary closure orders. This is due to the active wildfires throughout the state. One fire near the California-Nevada border prompted Lake Tahoe residents to evacuate. NTD's David Lamb reports. The Caldor Fire in Northern California's El Dorado County is now over 190,000 acres. As of Tuesday, it is 16% contained. The two-week-old fire approaches South Lake Tahoe, prompting the mayor to evacuate with the residents, despite the upcoming Labor Day weekend. The evacuation was actually very orderly. There was a lot of traffic, but we were able to evacuate our city in just five hours, which is good. Vehicles loaded with outdoor gear were in gridlock traffic. The city has a population of about 22,000. It was just traffic jammed. I have no idea. It was everybody who just left at once. It was like the last minute. By Monday night, the Caldor fire had crossed state highways. It burned mountain cabins as it moved toward the Tahoe Basin. I have a home right in the danger area and I'm getting out. As soon as I secure this area, which is my business that I've had, well, I don't know, 40 years now. As soon as I secure it, I'm getting out of here. But I've got the, I'm going to leave all these sprinklers on. The U.S. Forest Service just announced a two and a half week closure of all of the state's national forests from visitors. The temporary closure is effective starting from Tuesday midnight to September 17th and closing down all 18 of the state's forests. The Calder fire has been active since August 14th, but fire agencies do expect full containment by September 13th, about two weeks from now. David Lamb, NTD News, California. California legislators are trying to pass two bills that have been rewritten into vaccine mandate bills. One bill is already dead and the lawmakers have 10 days left to decide what to do with the other bill. Here's NTD's Cynthia Kai with the details. Some California legislators are using a gut and amend method to rewrite two existing assembly bills, AB 455 and AB 1102, to include vaccination mandates. According to the California legislature, gut and amend is when amendments to a bill remove the current contents in their entirety and replace them with different provisions. AB 455 was originally a transportation and traffic bill, but documents obtained by the California Globe last week showed the bill was rewritten to mandate employees in the private industry to receive COVID vaccines or weekly testing or risk termination. In Twitter posts on Monday, Assemblyman Kevin Kiley confirmed that the new language of AB 455 still is not in print and that the bill is dead for the year. However, AB 1102 is still active. Originally a telephone advice service bill, documents obtained by the California Globe show AB 1102 now contains wording that requires COVID vaccines as a condition of employment. Governor Gavin Newsom held a press conference today, highlighting California's vaccine milestones. We're very proud in closing that the state of California asserted itself as the first state in this country to require all state employees to have state verification and or testing requirements, the first state in the country to require all health care workers to have a mandate for vaccinations. As of August 30th, approximately 66.5% of California's vaccine-eligible population is fully vaccinated. Lawmakers have until September 10th to pass any remaining bills before the California legislature adjourns for the year. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. Coming up in China, cases of the deadly and highly infectious disease anthrax are surfacing in at least three provinces. Among them, one patient has died. And the U.S. and U.K. have assembled one of the most powerful naval formations in the Western Pacific. They're gathering in what waters near China. That and more in just a moment on NTD News. China is now seeing a surge of a deadly disease called anthrax. It's emerged in at least three provinces, and officials just announced the first human death case in a decade. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. 
The U.S. is offering a reward for information on a Chinese fentanyl trafficker while Beijing defends him. The State Department said Monday it would give up to $5 million for information leading to the man's location, his arrest or conviction. The Chinese trafficker named Zhang Jian is a key leader of a transnational criminal organization. It's known for manufacturing fentanyl and its analogs from at least four known labs in China. The organization also advertised illicit drugs on the Internet to customers in the U.S. and Canada. It has allegedly sent thousands of orders of fentanyl products around the world since it started in 2013. Fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin. If convicted, Zhang would face life imprisonment and about $13 million in fines. Beijing banned fentanyl and its analogs in 2019. Yet on Tuesday, Beijing defended Zhang, saying he hasn't violated any Chinese law. They're calling on the U.S. to cancel its bounty. According to a U.S. federal commission, most fentanyl products coming into the U.S. still originate in China. A deadly and highly infectious disease has surfaced in at least three Chinese provinces. It's called anthrax, and this month marks China's first human death case linked to the disease in 10 years. That's based on official figures. The death struck in the country's Shandong province. Nearly 5,000 others there were found to have had contact with confirmed patients or related animals. They've since been put under isolation and are receiving preventive medical treatment. A weekly report from Shandong CDC revealed that two confirmed anthrax cases were reported to the agency in mid-August. The first patient, a 14-year-old student, died at the beginning of the month. He had developed symptoms like fever, fatigue and convulsions. The CDC's weekly report was released August 27th, over 20 days after the first patient's death. The second patient was linked to the first, having visited the first patient's home to help slaughter cattle. Doctors later diagnosed him with cutaneous anthrax. That means he caught the infection through skin contact with the bacterium. Anthrax is often found in cattle and sheep. Human infection can happen after contact with sick animals or contaminated products. The most dangerous form of the infection is pulmonary anthrax, caused by inhaling droplets or dust containing the bacterium. It has a fatality rate of over 80 percent. Those infected develop flu-like symptoms, like a sore throat, mild fever and fatigue. That worsens into shortness of breath and may cause death. Shandong isn't the only part of China facing the problem. On August 9th, city authorities in Beijing also reported an anthrax case. The patient came from the neighboring Hebei province and had a history of contact with local cattle and sheep. He had traveled to Beijing for medical treatment days after symptoms developed. Local media outlets have not published follow-up reports on the patient's situation after treatment. Elsewhere in central China's Shanxi province, nine people developed symptoms, including blisters, ulcers and dark spots. Eight of them were later diagnosed with anthrax. Local officials say the origin of the bacterium hasn't been found yet. A fleet of U.S. and U.K. aircraft carriers are sailing near China. It's one of the world's most powerful fleets. Carrying hundreds of long-range missiles, it boasts more firepower than most countries reserve in their entire naval force. NTD's Don Ma has more. The U.S. and the U.K. have assembled one of the world's most powerful naval formations near China, in the waters surrounding Okinawa, Japan. It's among the most formidable group of ships to sail together in years, and it's not a coincidence that it appeared near China's coast. Recently, Beijing has been increasing its military assertiveness in the region, mainly towards Taiwan. The joint U.S.-U.K. move indicates a potential warning to China's Communist Party, or CCP, that upsetting the status quo in the region could be matched with a powerful response. For China, this is a warning sign. It's undeniable that the U.S. military deployment and military strength in the Indo-Pacific region cannot be underestimated. The naval formation is composed of three aircraft carriers. That's the USS America, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, and the nuclear-powered USS Carl Vinson. A former Chinese Communist Party military personnel tells NTD that in a military confrontation, China is no match for America's power. Why does the United States place such a large force on the Western Pacific and at the doorstep of the CCP? 
I think it is a strategic deterrence. It's to tell the CCP to settle down. In an actual confrontation, this force is terrifying and very powerful. I think the CCP couldn't defend against it. The Naval Assembly is part of the two countries' maritime deployment operations. Those operations also include training exercises. And on each carrier are dozens of advanced fighter jets. In total, they carry nearly 80 combined aircrafts. These carriers are accompanied by Dutch and British support escorts. These carriers are also sporting several submarines and hundreds of long-range missiles. Together, these carriers and escorts possess more firepower than most countries have in their entire naval fleets. By comparison, China currently deploys just two aircraft carriers. Don Ma, NTD News. The Polish government on Tuesday asked the country's president to introduce a state of emergency in two regions on its border with Belarus. This comes as the country faces a spike in illegal migration. The state of emergency would last for 30 days, according to Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. President Andrzej Duda is likely to approve the state of emergency, which would give authorities broader powers to monitor and control people's movements. Morawiecki blames the border chaos on the actions of Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. The situation on the border with Belarus is a crisis and is still tense. This is because Lukashenko's regime decided to transport people, mostly from Iraq. Most of those in Belarus are Iraqi citizens, to push these people into Polish, Lithuanian and Latvian territory in an effort to destabilize the situation on the territory of our countries. Poland began building a barbed wire fence last week along the border in an effort to curb the flow of migrants from countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan, crossing from Belarus. In August, about 3,000 people tried to cross the border from Belarus to Poland illegally, the Polish interior minister said, adding the majority of them were stopped by border guards and soldiers. Polish authorities have faced criticism from human rights groups for not accepting migrants and for denying those at the border adequate medical care. Warsaw says they are the responsibility of the Belarusian authorities. Relations between the European Union and Belarus have worsened sharply over the past year. Since Lukashenko claimed victory in an election, his opponents and Western countries say was rigged. The EU has imposed economic sanctions on Belarus. The bloc has accused Lukashenko of deliberately encouraging illegal migrants to cross into Poland and the Baltic states Latvia and Lithuania in a form of hybrid warfare. In the choppy waters off the North Sea, the world's first floating wind farm is offering a future template for power supply. There's great potential for this prototype to be a major pioneer in wind power. NTD's Joanne Robson brings us the story. High Wind Wind Farm off the coast of Scotland started operations in 2017 and has outperformed other wind farms in the UK. The key to wind energy generation is a consistent supply of strong winds, something this area is not short of. High wind Scotland is around 25 kilometres offshore. We have an export cable bringing power just north of Peter's Head, directly connecting to uh, the UK grid. One of the advantages of having offshore wind farms is that they will have less of an impact on the scenic views than if they were built closer to the coast. The enormous turbines stand at over 100 metres above the water's surface with a further 78 metres of structure underneath. They're each kept in place by three anchors that use suctions. The weight of these structures, we're looking at something around 20,000 tonnes, and the power we're producing from these five turbines alone will power approximately 36,000 homes. The Norwegian oil and gas company Equinor holds a majority stake in high wind. It believes Scotland could be a global competitor in the offshore wind industry. We've now broken in 2020 the UK record for capacity factor. So to the consumer that means that we get a much more reliable wind profile, much more reliable energy source from uh, floating offshore wind than is achievable by fixed bottom. In November the UK will host the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26 in Glasgow. Its goal is to discuss the climate goals and targets of the Paris Agreement. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Coming up, the director of the Venice Film Festival says this year's films are of particularly high quality. Partly it's because so many movies were postponed during the pandemic lockdowns. 
find out which movies will get their world premiere in just a moment here on NTD News. Hi folks, Joe Namath here with a new message about your Medicare benefits. You may be entitled to transportation, meals, and expanded coverage for dental work that includes extractions, fillings, and dentures, all at no additional cost. Plus, depending on your zip code, you may be entitled to the Medicare benefit that adds money to your Social Security check every single month. Call and get everything you deserve. Call now. It's free. I'm on a fixed income, so I called to get money added to my Social Security check. They helped me so much. I called to save money on co-pays, get prescriptions, transportation, and my dental work covered. I couldn't believe I was spending money I don't have to spend. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline, and you can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. The director of the Venice Film Festival said putting this year's edition together was an easy task with so many mo movies held back because of the pandemic and stars and filmmakers eager to travel again. The 78th Venice Film Festival opens on Wednesday with Pedro Almodovar's Parallel Mothers starring Penelope Cruz and Melina Smith paving the way for a celebrity heavy event. Uh, everybody everywhere is eager to come back to reopen, to restart, to release the films that they stay on the shelf for one year and a half or maybe two years. So, I mean, they were so willing to come, to come to Venice that it was easy. We know that most of the films in the main competition are already sold out and uh, it is a good sign, but it means that someone will not be able to get the tickets. So. Among the movies getting their world premiere during the 10-day showcase are Denis Villeneuve's highly anticipated and star-studded Dune, Pablo Lorraine Spencer starring Kirsten Stewart as Princess Diana, Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog with Kirsten Dunst, Ridley Scott will screen his medieval epic The Last Duel on the penultimate day of the festival, with Hollywood heavyweights Matt Damon, Ben Affleck and Jodie Comer expected to join the filmmaker on the Venice red carpet. We saw a lot of films, and the surprise was to discover that the quality is higher than usual. It's like the pandemic uh, served as a sort of stimulation for the creativity of all the filmmakers, and most of them did one of their most beautiful films. So, uh, yeah, we have a very strong lineup. We, we couldn't invite all the films that we saw, that we loved, that we liked, because, because of lack of space. As in 2020, strict pandemic restrictions are in place at the festival site, with screening venues operating at half capacity and a wall blocking the view to the red carpet to stop crowds from gathering outside the main venue, Palazzo del Cinema. Everybody entering the theater will need to have a green pass. Those who are not vaccinated can take a COVID-19 test. Chloe Zhao, the director of last year's Golden Lion winner Nomadland, will be among the filmmakers deciding the winning films at this year's event, with South Korean Parasite director Bong Joon-ho presiding over the jury. Altogether, 21 titles will be vying for the Venice Lion trophies this year. This year's festival runs from September 1st to 11th. Traditional fairy tales have been brought to life at a Russian museum. A family team has built sets to tell stories and even dress up as some well-loved characters. NTD's Trevor Piper has the story. Three Russian heroes greet guests at the Museum of Russian Fairy Tales near Volograd. They meet the Nightingale, the Robber and a Three-Headed Dragon. Characters from fairy tales, folklore and Slavic myths come alive through the actors' stories. Many of our own scenarios are based on Pushkin's style or characters from Pushkin's fairy tales. So this head of Sviatagor first protects our kingdom state. And second, it is an extra reminder so that people read Russian fairy tales. Pavlova and her family design all the items in the museum. Her son-in-law dresses as Ivan Serovich and gives a tour to visitors. The most important thing is to convey to the viewer 
the wisdom of the ages and simplicity, human simplicity, which helps to solve many problems. After all, Ivan Sarevich is kind, not very wise, but still, he always solves all obstacles in fairy tales, solves all problems. The museum keeps growing. Recently, the Bogolasi Enchanted Forest appeared. Pavlova refers to fairy tale illustrations and Soviet fairy movies to get the right look. I am impressed, not so much by the characters, but by the energy that each of them gives. Energy of a fairy tale, hope, love, life. The atmosphere here is life-affirming. People come from all over the country to visit the museum. It has become a landmark since opening 15 years ago. I am surprised that in our time, people give not just their talent, but also a part of their souls to their beloved work. The museum was awarded Best Social Project of 2020 in an annual competition. Trevor Piper, NTD News. Capybaras are known to be friendly animals, but too many of them can still cause a problem. Frustrated locals in a wealthy Argentine suburb are looking for ways to keep a lid on the population of the native creatures. Hundreds of capybaras are living with residents in an upscale residential area of Buenos Aires province. The capital's growing urbanization has seen homes built on this area that was once wetlands for local life. According to local reports, some 400 capybaras live among the 40,000 residents of this neighborhood. Locals say they're not opposed to the capybaras, but want its population to be better managed. According to reports, there has been a significant increase in capybara numbers over the last decade. The capybara is a semi-aquatic mammal with a vegetarian diet, angering some locals who say the animal is destroying their lawns and gardens. The capybara can be found across South America and is the world's largest rodent, measuring up to 4.2 feet long. And finally, a French graffiti artist has created a monumental mountaintop project. He says he aims to lift people's spirits by capturing the childlike wonder of watching clouds drift by. NTD's Joy Duguid brings us the story. High in the Swiss Alps, a gigantic work of graffiti art on a mountainside. The 1,500 square metre painting by French artist Saip graces the summit of Molson Peak. Here I painted a little boy who is blowing just like those toys you had when you were a kid that blows bubbles and creates clouds. And the idea is that my work always interacts with the environment, and I feed on the environment, and the work feeds on the environment. There's a bit of both, and I have to create a real synergy between the work, the space around it, and the aesthetics of the place. The piece is called a nouveau souffle, which means a new lease of life. I think we live in a world that induces anxiety, and we need a little lightness. So I believe that the clouds are also a bit about dreams and imagination. Saip uses biodegradable paints made from natural pigments like coal and chalk. What's special about my work, in my opinion, is that there is real research and development. And then I developed a paint that is meant to be eco-responsible. In general terms, it's water, charcoal, chalk and casein, which is a protein in milk. We're in the right region for that, which I use as a kind of natural glue. Saip is known for massive works of graffiti on grass, best seen from the air. His previous sites range from a South African shanty town to the lawn at the United Nations in Geneva. Joy Duguid, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.